Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, We pray that as we come to it now, you would send your Holy Spirit among us. Uh, We pray that you would open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts uh, to see you for who you really are and to live in the light of that. Amen. Well, I want to start this morning with a question, uh, but not a a rhetorical question. This is one uh, I want us to discuss together for just a minute. And the question is this, uh, when do we find it hard to trust God? Um, I'll put that another way. What sort of things make trusting God difficult? Um, I'm going to ask you to just turn to your neighbours, maybe the people you were talking to earlier, and discuss that for for about a minute. Uh, I've got some pictures here uh, which might kind of stimulate some ideas. Uh, When do we find it hard to trust God? Go. Well, uh, thank you for being good sports and, uh, and joining in. Um, I hope that kind of helps to demonstrate that actually there are all sorts of things in this life which make it hard for us to trust God. There are all sorts of situations which can make it seem like God isn't in control. Uh, another word for trusting God is faith. And this passage focuses us on a God who is always worthy of our faith, always worth trusting in. Uh, Chapters 48 to 50 bring the story of Joseph and the book of Genesis as a whole to an end. And just like all good series finales, these chapters draw together all that's happened so far and also point us forward to what is going to come next. Uh, One of the major themes of the book of Genesis Uh, as a whole, and Joseph's story in particular is that of God's plan. Uh, From the earliest chapters, we're introduced to a God who isn't distant from the world uh, or well-meaning, but really not in control. Uh, We're constantly reminded all the way through Genesis and all the way through Joseph's story that God has a good plan for his people. Uh, We're told about his plan uh, in different ways, Uh, Sometimes God himself makes promises to his people, uh, great big promises, like the promises that Jacob uh, speaks about in in chapter 48, verse 3, of a people and a land to come. Uh, Sometimes God's plan is expressed through prophecies, uh, like the dreams that Joseph has uh, all the way through his stories, Uh, whether through promises or prophecies, we're constantly being told about God's good plan for his people. And as we look at these final chapters of Genesis, and we see the culmination of all that has happened so far, God's plan again comes into the spotlight. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, your Roman gods. Uh, You might be familiar with a Mars Uh, or a Jupiter, or they may just be planets to you. Uh, You may or may not be familiar with this chap. Uh, This is uh, Janus, and Janus was the the god of doorways, uh, amongst other things, and he had two faces. You can see uh, two faces there, and the point was he had one face always looking forward and one face always looking back. In this passage, God's people are a bit like 
Janus. A lot of this passage is spent looking forward to the next stage of God's plan. What's God going to do next? But at the same time, the passage is focused on looking back at what God has already done. Looking forward and looking back at the same time. This passage tells us that faith looks forwards to God's future plans and at the same time looks back at God's fulfilled plans. Let's start by thinking about God's future plans. Uh, This passage starts with its focus on Jacob, the end of Jacob's life. And in particular, we see Jacob adopting Joseph's sons that were born to him in Egypt. Uh, In chapter 48, verse 5, we read, Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. That's a bit of a strange visit to the grandparents, isn't it? Resulting in the the, the children being adopted, uh, not very usual. Um, But it was more common uh, in the ancient world. What's happening here is that Joseph's sons are being grafted into the next phase of God's plan for his people, the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes that come from Jacob, who, who was also called Israel. And Ephraim and Manasseh are to be the figureheads of two of those tribes, which the next stage of God's plan uh, centers around. Uh, following the adoption of Joseph's sons, Jacob again turns his attention to the future of the people of Israel. Uh, Look down at chapter 48, verse 21 with me. Uh, We didn't uh, read this, uh, but let's read it together now. Then Israel, uh, that's Jacob, said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. Uh, Important to notice there that the the yous there are plural. Uh, he's not just speaking to Joseph. He's including all of his people in that, in that prophecy. God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. Even in these last moments of Jacob's life, he is pointing his people to the hope of what is to come. God rescuing his people from famine and giving them land in Egypt wasn't the end of God's plan for his people. It was just the beginning. God wasn't going to leave them living as aliens in the land of Egypt. The next stage of his plan was to bring them home to the land he had promised generations ago to Abraham. In chapter 49, the focus on the future continues as Jacob prophesies about his sons one by one. And he's uh, prophesying about what's going to happen to the tribes uh, that come uh, from them. Uh, We don't have time to look at each of them now. Uh, We'll come back to look at one in particular a little later on. Uh, Finally, after Jacob finishes explaining what is to come, what is going to happen in the future to the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob uses his last words to ensure the people are left in no doubt as to God's future plan. Uh, Look down to chapter 49, verse 29 with me. These are some famous last words of Jacob. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. Jacob even wants his death to proclaim the certainty in the future plans of God. He demands not to be buried and left in Egypt, but in the family tomb all those miles away in Canaan. Why is he so insistent? Uh, A few weeks ago, Emma and I went out to buy a mattress. Uh, It was a pretty strange experience, lying on a load of different beds with a salesman kind of a few uh, inches away, just hovering there. Uh, But we got there in the end, 
and uh, we found one we liked, but we couldn't take delivery of it, we couldn't buy it straight away, uh, so we put down a deposit. We paid uh, part of the price, and even though we don't own the mattress yet, we're sure that it's going to be our mattress because we've put down the deposit. One day, that, de- that mattress will belong to us. And the family tomb in Canaan and the bodies that were buried there acted a little bit like a deposit on the land God had promised to his people. God's people hadn't come to take hold of that promised land just yet. But the bodies of the forefathers that were buried there testified that one day it would belong to his people. Uh, Fast forward to the end of the story, right at the end of chapter 50, and you see that Joseph dies with the same confidence, the same uh, emphasis in his last words, anticipating the future plan of God confident that God will rescue his people from the land of Egypt and fulfill that promise to bring his people home. Uh, Look down right to the end of the passage, chapter 50, verse 24. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land, to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Can you hear the confidence brimming in Joseph's dying words? Can you feel the the power, the urgency of his insistence that he too, even in his death, is included in God's future plan for his people. This isn't someone who has a kind of vague hope that everything's going to work out all right in the end. In their deaths, both Jacob and Joseph were looking straight forward and pointing those around them to God's good plan for his people. Faith looks forward to God's future plan. Well, let's think of the other side of the coin. Faith looks back at God's fulfilled plans. When I was about nine years old, I entered a competition in a national newspaper to go to the premiere of Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. I was obsessed with Star Wars when I was a kid. I I kind of still am now. Um, I was so excited about the idea of winning this competition and being one of the first people to go and watch the film that I convinced myself that I was going to win. I couldn't explain it. I didn't know how, but I just knew I was going to win that competition. I worked myself up so much about it because I was sure I was going to go uh, to see that film before anyone else. I remember staying up at night thinking about how amazing, how cool it would be to meet all the cast. And I thought about how smug I'd be the next day when I told my mates at school what I'd been up to. I was so excited. It just had to happen. Of course, it didn't. I never heard back about the competition at all. Maybe someone else won it, who knows. And I remember being so disappointed I even feel a little bit disappointed now that I think about it. Uh, I was full of confidence at the time uh, that this was going to happen. But my confidence wasn't built on anything. It was misplaced confidence, wasn't it? Was the same thing happening with Jacob and Joseph? Were they so caught up in the the idea of this promised land, this great big promise they'd been given, uh, that they just worked themselves up and convinced themselves that good times were ahead. Well, no. This was not blind faith. Jacob and Joseph's faith wasn't kind of groundless optimism. It was built on God's fulfilled plans. Uh, The key example of this is found in chapter 50, uh, verse 19. Uh, It's one of the most well-known verses in Joseph's story, and it gloriously 
summarizes all that Joseph's life has been demonstrating along the way, and it puts the cherry on top of all that Genesis has been telling us about who God is, and it's astonishing. Look down with me at verse 15 of chapter 50. Uh, In the penultimate scene of Genesis, Joseph's brothers are filled with worry. Uh, They suddenly realize the vulnerable position they're in. Sadly, it's not uncommon for families to fall apart after the death of a parent. And this seems to be the source of the brothers' fear here, that now their father Jacob is dead, Joseph will have no reason not to get vengeance on them for how they treated him all those years ago when they sold him into slavery. So the brothers hatch their plan, delivering a message in the voice of their dead father, instructing Joseph to forgive his brothers for their evil acts. We aren't directly told, but I think there's more than a suggestion that this is a fabrication by the brothers, that they're doing anything they can to avoid Joseph's judgment. And Joseph is moved to tears by this message. His brothers throw themselves down before him, saying, we are your slaves. Think about the reversal there. This story of Joseph started with the brothers selling Joseph into slavery to avoid getting his blood on their hands. And now, all these years later, the same brothers are desperate to be Joseph's slaves to keep their blood from his hands. Imagine the scene. Imagine being one of those brothers there, throwing yourself face down before Joseph, knowing exactly what you'd done to him and what it had meant for him, wondering whether that message you delivered would convince him to spare your life or whether worse punishment was in store store for you. Maybe he'd leave you in a well to die, just like you'd planned to do to him all those years ago. And as you close your eyes and hold your breath and wait for judgment to fall on you, you can feel the beads of sweat forming on your forehead. And then you hear your brothers, your brother, say these words. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. What a turnaround. No death for the brothers, not even slavery. Joseph is going to take care of them and even provide for their families. Why has Joseph chosen not to take revenge? Why has he come to this point of forgiveness? It's because he's looked back at God's fulfilled plans in his life. Uh, Perhaps his brothers throwing themselves down before him reminded him of the dreams that he had as a young man, telling him of God's plan that his brothers would one day bow down to him. Uh, Whatever the case, Joseph proclaims that through all that has happened to him, God has been working to bring about his good plan. Joseph's words here uh, end Genesis, giving us a huge view of who God is. Uh, Notice what Joseph doesn't say here. He doesn't turn to his brothers and say, you know, don't worry, I'm sure you didn't mean to hurt me, and Actually, things worked out all right in the end, didn't they? He doesn't say, well, you did intend to harm me, but actually God is really good, and he's good enough to make the best of every bad situation. What Joseph says here is even more amazing. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Somehow, the brother's evil plan was all part of God's good plan for his people, his plan to raise Joseph up 
and save the nations from the famine that came. The book of Genesis tells us over and over again that God has a good plan for his people. But the story of Joseph proclaims to us that God is so awesome, so amazing, so powerful, that he even weaves evil, rebellion, and sin into his plan. Joseph's confidence in God's future plans uh, to deliver his people from oppression in Egypt, they don't come from blind faith or just wanting to believe a nice idea. They come from knowing that God is a plan-completing, promise-fulfilling God who even works evil, pain and suffering together into his good plan for his people. Faith looks back at God's fulfilled plans. So how about us? How are you going to remain faithful when the world seems so uncertain, when global events seem like they're spinning out of control? How can we keep trusting God every day when our lives are filled with pain and suffering, when every day and every night is full of the torments of physical pain, when you suffer the loss of a loved one, when you get turned down for that dream job that seemed like it was going to be just right, or the long-awaited house move drags on into another frustrating month, when you long for your family to turn to Jesus and be saved, but with each passing month they seem more and more hard-hearted. How are we as God's people to remain faithful even through the troubles of this world? Just the same way as Joseph and Jacob did. Just like Joseph and Jacob, we need to always be looking forward to God's future promises and always looking back to God's fulfilled promises. And living thousands and thousands of years after Jacob and Joseph, we have the privilege of being able to see how much more of God's good plan for his people has played out. And we can see many more of the promises and prophecies he's delivered on. Uh, We can look back to the book of Exodus and see how God did bring his people out of Egypt. We can even read about how uh, the people of Israel took Joseph's bones with them when they left. But most of all, we can read about the person who God's plan revolves around, Jesus Christ. Uh, Even the passage we read together today contains a prophecy about the about God's chosen king who was to come look at chapter 49 verse 10 with me this is uh, the prophecy to Judah and Jacob says this the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his This prophecy is telling us that God's promised king will come from the line of Judah and he will be a ruler who isn't just in charge of one tribe of the people of Israel. His rule will be global, including all the nations. We go on to be told that he'll be both powerful and beautiful. And of course, this prophecy is pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. God's chosen king, born in the line of Judah. Hundreds of years later, this promised ruler would be born as a baby, grow up to be a man, be rejected by his people, be tortured and put to death by the hands of men. And though humanity intended to harm Jesus, God intended it for good to accomplish his great work of salvation just like in joseph's life but magnified infinite times jesus death proclaims to us that god is a plan completing 
promise-fulfilling God, even using humanity's greatest act of evil, sin, and rebellion to bring about his greatest act of salvation. And because of that, we can be confident that God will surely bring about his plans for the future. Uh, Jacob, and jo- Jacob and Joseph were looking forward to God bringing his people out of, e- out of Egypt to Israel, but it's our privilege to look forward to the final home of God's people, not just the next stage of the plan, the very end. Uh, listen to these words from the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21. This is the glorious future God's people are headed for. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. As we look at the world around us, it may not seem like God is in control. As we experience the pain and suffering of this world, it can be extremely difficult to continue to put our faith in God. But we can trust him through all of it when we look forward to his plan to bring us home with him and put an end to all our pain and suffering. How can we be sure it's going to happen? Because we have a promise-fulfilling, plan-completing God. What a promise. What a future. What a plan. What a God. Look forward to his future promises. Look back at his fulfilled promises. Put your faith in him today. Amen.